I see there's some in the lobby and all of that there. But let's let's get started. You know, welcome to another DeCat session. Pretty excited to have you all on today. Um, my name is Paige Thompson Russ. Got my counterpart Jim McDermott. Um, we have a great agenda today. Just to let you know, I am recording this, so if your friends are not on, we will be able to get this sent out to them as we do have uh, CCA credit uh, opportunities as well. So, Jim, it's an exciting time of the year, getting some early uh, results coming in, yield results. The reports have been better than expected. And, you know, this is the second year in a row that that I'm saying that. Uh, these yields have been outstanding. Again, it's early, but what I'm hearing, it's pretty awesome. So what these plant breeders can do with stress tolerance is, is pretty cool. So what do you think? Want to jump into things? I think so. It is time. Just trying to figure out, uh, you know, if you shrunk yourself down or if that is actually the size of the ear. Uh, yeah, I guess if you're talking about unexpected yields, if if you have ears that size, especially if if you have thirty thousand of it, thirty thousand, then then you're doing it going to do pretty well there. Oh yeah, <laughs> impressive. <laughs> I take the bird's eye view. I go over the whole field as my background. Yeah. Well, all right, yeah, let's uh, let's jump right into the agenda, and you know as we've tried to do a few times, so make this as current as possible. The C and the D cat is for current. Uh, so some areas got a frost update or uh, some areas got a frost so we'll talk a little bit about that obviously too early to see the effects yet but uh, um, like to hear from the group uh, on what you're seeing with harvest observations talk a little bit about diseases even with dry weather especially on corn it seems like late season diseases have reared their head and made their presence known and then a few other little odds and ends, and then uh, we'll finish up with questions or any other topics that we haven't hit on. That's good. And Paige, I know we've been short on rain, and you really like to drive that point home with how short we have been on rain for the growing season. Well, I, I do enjoy the, the weather maps and stuff. So this is the precipitation total. It'll probably be the last time that I pull these, but um, you can see the differences throughout the state, uh, quite stark differences from, say, central Iowa that have accumulated around 27 inches versus, you know, into your neck of the woods, Jim. Gosh, uh, some nine inch totals, some 14 inch totals, uh, a lot of differences. You know, last year we had some lower rainfalls as well, but I really think the driver this year on some of the variability is that heat that we had at certain times. Yeah, I would agree, you know, because we can get by on, you know, less than the 25 inches of rain that corn needs or the 22 inches of rain roughly that soybeans needs. But if we have heat, especially at the wrong time, uh, then that can make all the difference in the world. And then here's some of the uh, departures from normal. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as as you would know, um, that far northwest Iowa behind about 11 inches and in that that's Plymouth County right there, isn't it? If I'm right. Well, the one with the dark red is Sioux and then uh, Sioux. Okay. Plymouth County has the 6.65 in the yep. negative. Yep, yep. But so yeah, I just wanted to go over that real quick. All right, well, um, Officially here in Spencer, well, maybe not officially, but at least on my electronic thermometer, I had 29 degrees. Um, usually we're one of the coldest spots in the whole state. Um, but I don't know, I see Brian Rossberg up at Esterville. Usually that's another cold spot. Brian, did you have anything for frost up that direction? Yep, it was 30 degrees when we got up. She's a little frosty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it seems like it's is that time of the year. Um, I think at least for Clay County, the average frost date for a killing frost is the first week of October at around that fourth or fifth. So you know, we're a little on the earlier side. I, I, I don't think this is officially gonna be one of those hard killing frosts, at least just from the report I've heard so far. Uh, but just looking at potential effect on yield and, and soybeans, I would be surprised if there's any effect. In fact, most people have been 
gearing for a frost on soybeans stage, yeah. <laughs> try to kill some of those leaves and maybe take some of the green out of the stems, make them a little easier to harvest. You know, maybe we can actually start harvesting in the morning versus waiting till the afternoon. But uh, yield wise, um, most most of our soybeans were in that R7, you know, where we had obviously had started to turn color or, you know, we're starting to drop leaves. Uh, so I would be surprised to really see anything for a uh, yield effect. If we did have some green areas and, you know, if we were at that uh, R6 and a half, which essentially when we've got the full size beans in the top nodes, and we're just just starting to maybe turn a little color, you know, potentially we can get up to 7% yield loss, but as you can see, it's a pretty wide range, you know, zero to 7%. Um, so could have a few pockets in some fields that uh, you know, are, are gonna knock off a few bushels, but I think that's gonna be the exception rather, rather than the rule on soybeans. Uh, corn may be a little different uh, on corn. Um, you know, we certainly can still see yield loss, even though we've started to move that milk line down. You know, and as we've talked before, really over the last few weeks, uh, we have slowed down the uh, movement to black layer. Uh, hopefully, you know, we've continued to add weight and continue to add kernel depth. Um, but you know, there's there's still a lot of fields, even with some late April or early May planting dates that have not black layered. Uh, but as you can see at half milk line, on a light frost, you know, zero to two percent is is the uh, estimated yield loss. So pretty uh, negligible. Um, if if we're still at say uh, hard net where we just started to move that milk line down, say a quarter milk line, you know, then that's when we can start to get into a little bit higher yield loss. Um, most cases, with especially if it ends up being a light frost across the board. Usually we're just taking out, out leaves and probably not doing much to uh, take the green out of the stalk. And as long as we've got some green in the stalk, we should be able to finish normally. And then the question comes up about dry down, because if we do have that premature frost, especially if we've got a uh, green husk, you know, that can slow dry down. Uh, right now, be curious what you think, Paige, but the way it looked to me is it, we probably shouldn't interfere with our natural dry down uh, just because most of our husks were were pretty well starting to turn brown anyway. Yeah, I've I've been spending a lot of time in fields um, plots as as you are also, and yeah, that's that's what I've seen too. Those husks are really really drying down, so I really don't see a huge um, yield loss with what we experience. I know in central Iowa, we are 36 um, degrees around that 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then, like you said, up in your area around that 29 to 30. So hopefully we just see a little bit on those leaves and light frost there. So, yeah. All right, well, let's keep moving. And just, you know, as a reminder, we're starting to get some plots to come out. Of course, a lot of fields are being harvested. Um, and I think, we talk about this every year, but especially in years where we've got a lot of variability, and and that's, you know, that's been the the one theme this year. Obviously, with with stress, with soil type changes, we're going to see a lot of variability in yield. So, uh, you know, as usual, we never want to put too much emphasis on one plot or one field. Um, you know, we we don't know exactly the, the the stress it went through or or the consistency throughout that field. Comparing relative maturities, especially on corn, you know, the last few years, this has been huge. You know, five days of maturity meant at least 10 bushels, if not uh, 12 to 13. Uh, so that's always key. Make sure we're comparing apples to apples. Um, obviously, soil type, you know, uh, Paige, two weeks ago, you had the picture of, you know, a flat field that still looked like patchwork quilt. You know, you had dead areas, you had live areas. Um, so even fields that don't look like they have a lot of different variations in soil type or water holding capacity, you know, we still have all kinds of variation in how long that crop stayed alive. Um, edge effects, you know, we talked about this in the past, but I think again, this is gonna be a year on the south and west sides, especially if we're next to a pasture or soybeans or CRP, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna affect that, that yield uh, well into the field, some cases uh, at least 50 rows. Uh, of course, I, uh... Oh, go ahead. 
Real quick, Jim, um, you know, on that edge effect piece, I have gotten a few calls the past couple of days and and yeah, I, I didn't think we'd see it as intense as we did a couple of years ago, but a couple of reports that edge was going about 30 to 50 bushel for corn and the middle was going 240. So definitely keep that in mind if you if there are some plots, you know, up against soybeans or whatnot. Yeah, and it's all about the heat, you know, just uh, higher uh, respiration, higher evaporation rates on the outside. Um, and usually you think of just the outside few rows, but no, it, it went uh, quite a few rows in this year. The other thing to keep in mind too is spider mites, you know, both on the edges of corn and soybean fields. And we did end up in some areas with uh, quite a few spider mites and usually they're gonna hurt us at the most on that edge. Uh, of course, planting dates and timing of rains. Um, you know, always a big factor, but when we're under dry weather stress, you know, if we've got a crop that's still green and, and got that inch or more of rain, when it was still able to take advantage of it, boy, that, that can mean boy, 30 to 40 bushels on corn and 10, 15 bushels on beans. And we certainly saw that last year. I don't know if we'll see it to quite to the extent this year, but I, I think we'll, we'll still, still have it show up. And then lastly, the, uh, the rotation effect. Um, you know, the corn on corn, just from visual and the few reports we're seeing, I think is going to take more of a hit than uh, what we typically see. Um, some cases, again, back to just the higher stress levels. Uh, a corn crop takes more inches of moisture. So heading into the season, we, we knew corn on corn was going to be under a little more stress just from the number of inches used the previous year. Uh, and then maybe you take into account a little less rooting, a little less rooting depth, or just even some minor rootworm feeding can certainly cut into the ability for that plant to pull in water and nutrients. So it looks like I, there's going to be a big difference this year. Yeah, I, I do agree on that. Definitely, Jim. You know, I've been in some corn on corn, and I, I do see some ear variability as far as ear size. And I know we'll get into some of that a little later on, but um, something I've noticed. I guess before we jump into uh, some of the diseases that are out there, I guess, uh, Paige, uh, you, you mentioned some of the impressions so far on yields, but uh, I guess any other comments on on trends or anything that you're seeing so far? Yield is, it is all over the place. And, you know, as far as moisture stress, uh, you can definitely see the differences here, there, but Gosh, around that Webster County area, been getting some reports. 99 day taken out, uh, 49.72, and it was averaging 199. And that grower was just so happy because there was a time frame where there was some stress. So um, better than expected there. You know, Calhoun County getting some reports. Areas that did get a little rain, finding around that 230, but those areas that maybe just little pockets that didn't catch rains 160. So again, quite quite some uh, swings there. Yeah, and same thing on beans, you know, we've seen yields in the 20s. We've also seen yields uh, in the 70s. Um, uh, Jacob Mann and, and I were helping on a plot yesterday in Osceola County and you know saw sever several varieties that were in the uh, 70 bushel range. Um, another plot, that came out earlier in the week in Sioux County also had yields in the 70s. Um, surprise, surprise, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and taking into account, you know, these are good heavy soils, high fertility, and short rows. They're plot situations, so it doesn't always equate to field scenarios, but uh, it shows that there's still some pretty good top end on the soybean side. Oh, yeah. Very surprised. Yes, other impressions uh, from, from some of the, the group out there? Certainly, uh, you know, put some of the maybe yield levels that you're seeing in the chat, or if you want to come off mute and make a few comments on things you're seeing. Yeah, Jim Page, just Jason Kimberly, CBA, and uh, you know, up that Webster County area, it, it, the rain, the rain thing you talked about earlier is never so true. I mean, was with a guy the other day on a bean field, um, same variety planted two miles apart, same day and 14 bushel swing on where one farm two miles south cut an extra rain. Yeah. Um, so being so far out down this way, tore from Carroll kind of northeast, 
I would say have have been sitting pretty good. Uh, we caught some pretty good rains. Most of them, you know, hitting that 50s to I've heard mid 70s. Um, and then uh, corn, early corn that's come out um, has been tunning up nice. Um, but uh, we have had some dry pockets where we've had as low as 135 and as high as 255. So um, on average, I think we're we're probably 10 to 20 bushel, maybe a little bit below what we were last year on the overall, but we had kind of a home run sweet spot down here last year. So guys are seem to be pretty happy, but things are coming right along and moving out quickly. All right. Thanks, Jason. That's great info. Who else has some updates? Yeah, Paige, this is Jay Pearson um, here in Northwest Iowa. And um, tell you what, I've heard a lot of uh, a lot of like Jim said all over the board from the if you're on light ground it's it's going to be light and if you're on the heavy stuff it's pretty good I had some 64 64 do 255 and then you know, jump across the road to 56 65 and it was two what 225 so it was are you guys seeing later corns are probably gonna do very well over the early stuff this year or I suppose it depends on the rain and stuff too, but that's kind of what I've been seeing. Beans have been beans have been good. Where it's good, it's good, and like you say, where it's bad, it's bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. I think we will see some of the mid to later maturities uh, yield just a little more. That's what I've noticed in my area. What about you, Jim? Yeah, it's a little early to get a real clear cut trend. Uh, I I would expect that to be the case. Um, oh, this. This picture behind me, you know, typical of a lot of plots where you've got the full season over here where my hand is waving in the air. Um, you know, the, the, if, if we had some late moisture situation like that, it's going to take advantage of it versus what's over here. Um, this plot, I think, starts with 4650. Uh, so any moisture that's come within the last, oh, almost 10 days to two weeks is, is just not going to be used by anything on the earlier side over here so i think that's gonna that's gonna certainly help last year we saw that again you know five days of maturity meant at least 10 bushels so don't know if it'll be that extreme but i still think we'll see some some pretty big differences and advantages to full season i i do see in the chat um mike coolman uh, had a report uh, 4650, 96 day near the lakes, 221 at 25% moisture. Um, the hybrid is doing pretty darn well in my neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah. And the lakes are one of those sweet spots that, uh, as as we saw on your map, did have above normal precip, one of the few areas for the year. <clears throat> well, thanks uh, for the updates. And if there's other comments you want to make, continue to put them in the chat. We'll keep moving and uh, talk a little bit about what we're seeing out in the fields for uh, diseases right now. Yeah, just a couple of random ones that I've been getting some calls on is anthracnose and soybeans. And, you know, that's the black lesions. It's in an unorganized type pattern that you can see on the stem of the soybeans. Uh, you know, I can find that now and then. Uh, typically, it's not a huge, huge uh, issue depends on the year. In this particular field that I got a call on, uh, there were some some lodging and some harvestability issues, but uh, just kind of a one-off type situation here. By chance, was that one sprayed with fungicide page or? It yeah, yeah. It, it it was. Yeah, yeah. Probably at least sixty days ago, though. So there's probably right. not much residual effect anymore is because anthracnose does tend to come in late. Yeah. The next one is the diaporth complex uh, seed and uh, pod pod and stem blight and then as far as stem canker. And so then I was in this field finding both. So as you see uh, the upper left corner as far as those longitude longitudinal Oh my gosh, I cannot talk today. The section of that lower stem, um, it's an indicator of diaporth fungal infection. As you um, kind of shave off or even cut through that stem, you'll see those lines 
you know, pull through that entire stem there. That's a really good characteristic of that. And then down below with these, how you can tell the difference between anthracnose is that the 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 specks are um, linear rather than kind of, you know, an unorganized pattern what you see in anthracnose. So typically when we have this, uh, especially uh, the stem, the pod and stem blight, you know, the leaves can hang on, but that plant just kind of dies. But um, one thing that I found interesting with this one is that uh, several weeds such as velvet leaf and morning glories and pigweeds, it can host the diaporth complex. Those weeds don't show symptoms, but it can be a host of that of that disease, which is crazy. Yeah, and I would say the diaporthia complex has been on the increase, and we just we say, see more stem canker, we see more uh, pod and stem blight. Uh, you know, usually later in the season for pod and stem blight, but they are out there, and they can they can shut down plants early. Um, yeah. And sometimes you you don't notice it until you get in there with the combine. Well, just quickly uh, on the soybeans, um, and this is some information that was in the newsletter too. But just uh, you know, a few of the key varieties as we as we run through, and this time of the year, it's interesting to be able to look at some differences in maturity. Like for example, the uh, 15XF2s actually looking a little bit later than uh, the 16XF3s, and and I would say 15XF2s for the area that I cover has been doing very well so far. Yes, and you can see here um, some differences. It's looking as though 15 XF2s are a little, a little later than the 16 XF3s. 18 XF1s have looked good in my area, and if you remember, it's got it's a nice offense type variety. Um, it's it's done well uh, in my area, and and it's looking like 19 XF3s that new. Um, XF3 is going to be a good uh, combination with the 18 XF1. It's a strong yield with strong defense um, to it. So a great, great for agronomics across the board for that one. You could put it on some high pHs. And then, of course, the 21 XFO has been pretty darn proven. Um, it's looking good, too, in my neck of the woods. Yep. <clears throat> I would agree. And then jumping up into this next class, uh, you know, pretty big hitter with the 24 XF1s. Um, just starting to see some of that come out since it's a little bit later, but uh, that one is again has looked good. Um, it does have a little sensitivity to some of the PPO herbicides, so I noticed that early in the season, as does the 20 XF1s. Um, but in most cases, it was able to recover just fine and, and look real solid, especially on standability and, and just uh, overall disease package. 23 XF2s. I've gotten a few calls on that. Pretty excited uh, around that Pocahontas area averaging 78 bushel. And there are some spots where it's tough to to grow beans, whether it's high pHs. So pretty excited to hear that feedback. Mm -hmm. Well, then uh, shout out to our buddy Craig Lamori provided the picture. 23XF3s is a key new one for us, but uh, it was South American grown, so we didn't really want to wait till June to plant it in our normal market development plots. So this is in some of the breeding trials uh, that Craig gets a chance to take a look at. So um, that, especially that picture on the right, it looks like it's about a eight foot tall plant. So yeah. really going to do well. No, uh, th this is going to be a key one for us, especially um, to the west where it's got very good standability and very good white mold tolerance. And then moving on to some of the later, you know, 25 XF3s are looking pretty darn good in plots as well. More, I would say that's a Western type type being offense yield with average agronomics, but that yield, um, that yield lift there is outstanding, along with the 27 XF3s. It'll be really interesting to see uh, what we find with those. Uh, yeah, this this maturity sometimes gets ignored, but uh, boy, that 26 XF1, it's it's one to really rely on for, for just a solid bean that goes a lot of places. Yep. So you, well, you saw some 
diseases on the soybeans and, and of course, on corn as well. And it, it has been surprising because usually you think disease, wet conditions. Um, but these two have come on, and especially northern corn leaf blight, um, probably one of the heavier years I can remember for northern. And, and a lot of it, again, came on late. So not huge yield impacts, but it's just as a reminder that, hey, it's there. We need to uh, select hybrids with tolerance. Um, the picture on the left has both northern corn leaf blight as well as tar spot. Uh, that was in uh, Buena Vista County. Um, but, you know, both of them, six to seven hours of continuous leaf wetness, which with, with some dews, we've had that, especially as we've cooled down at night now and moderate temperatures. Um, you know, that 60 to 70, pretty ideal for both of them as well. Uh, so we've been in that in that ideal temperature for them, but uh, been a little bit surprising. You know, tar spot is sure been talked about and it continues to move north and west. You know, a lot of areas still not high levels, but uh, the northern is the one that uh, has, has come on even faster. And, and, you know, there's some cases where, um, again, if it's a, uh, if it's a field that didn't have fungicide, uh, it was probably showing up several weeks ago. The fungicide at least held it off long enough where I think it's going to provide protection. I want to say it was a good, gosh, four weeks ago when things kind of switched. You know, we have had a lot more dews and it, it cooled off a little bit as well. And then it just came in. So. I've been finding some southern rust in corn um, uh, across my territory. Not not a lot, but you can find it out there. And uh, the picture on the right isn't the best. It's not as clear, but you can see the dark um, brown around that pustule. And it, it can get confusing. I've gotten some calls like, hey, is this tar spot? But with southern rust, if you remember, it is blown in from uh, tropical areas. Uh, you can see the pustules there. But again, like I said, you know, as the disease kind of progresses or gets later in the season, it, it has this darker browning around that pustule. And it does like the 77 to 82 degrees um, type temperature, so warmer. All right, then to finish up, you know, just a few shots of some corn that uh, I'm amazed you've got some of those hybrids to fit into the ear board as girthy as they are, Paige. Yeah, 105.33 and 56.65, that, those two are extremely girthy, that deep kernel depth, it's uh, definitely the driver on yield with those two, but impressive, those two, uh, that chunky, girthy ear there, but no, it's fun to go through this plot late last week, May 10th planting. They did have some pretty good moisture there. Um, 107.33 and 59.81, pretty darn consistent down the row with those two in the plot, but overall uh, a really neat plot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not all of our fields look perfect. And, you know, there's definitely been some variability and, um, both on uh, ear size uh, as well as just ear fill. Um, these are more stress situations, but uh, there there has been nubbins that uh, I think would be contributed more to the fact that we had uneven emergence. Um, yeah. you know, been a long time since we planted page, but uh, you know th there's fields that uh, you know, you look at them and they really didn't look too bad. You know the population was generally there, but uh, I think this year being one to two leaf stages behind probably gave us a little bit bigger penalty. Uh, again, going back to stress, um, you know, some years if you're, if you're getting moisture, those those late ears or late plants can catch up and, and have ear fill. But if we run not short of moisture like this year, especially towards the end of the season, those smaller root systems, smaller stalks just really did not allow that ear to fill out. So I'm, I'm seeing more variability this year, uh, more more nubbins. Um, and in some cases, uh, it, it, it really just looked like uh, that the potential was there and and then it just never was able to develop, even if it had a halfway decent root system. Um, but really some of the some of the causes um, listed here 
the the corn rootworm feeding, you know, we've talked about this a few times, how we really didn't have as much pressure as what we've had in, in 20 and 21. Uh, but, you know, if you go out now, especially get in the afternoon when there's some heat going and you see plenty of beetles. Uh, so, you know, there was feeding. It maybe just wasn't uh, as obvious this year. But again, very minor or low level rootworm feeding was enough to, to allow that stress to really shrink that uh, ear size back this year. So even even minor rootworm feeding still still was a huge factor this year. Yeah. I I would say you've experienced it a little more intense, kind of like those pictures that you pulled up. I've seen some variability on my side of Northwest Iowa, but um, like I said earlier, more so in that corn on corn, but nothing to that extreme kind of in some of those pictures though. All right, any other topics? The last thing I had, Paige, was just the matter of, uh, you know, we've got a lot of resources out there and just as a reminder, um, you know, decalb.com, there's plenty of different uh, bulletins, but Ag Seed Select is one that uh, I think gets overlooked. But Ag Seed Select is where you have all the product profiles, um, there's placement information, collateral material. Um, you can put together your own seed guide. You know, you can you can click on, say, the top six products that you're dealing with and just uh, create your your own little um, you know, two page guide. So don't forget about this page, especially for product profiles. So a lot of good information on agseedselect.com. Definitely one of my favorites to go to to look at things. So, well, I think we're coming up on time. Definitely appreciate everybody that's on and let us know when plots are being taken out. Uh, pretty exciting time of year, like I had mentioned earlier. But uh, what else do you have, Jim? I think it's time to open it up for a barrage of questions. <clears throat> I like any comments, questions out there from the group or any other uh, observations on yield. Well, if you can think of anything, let us know. Uh, definitely be safe out there. But. Yeah, once again, we appreciate everyone for being on. Uh, we'll send out the recording uh, with the QR code. So you'll have that to get the uh, the half credit for CCAs. Um, but Paige, I think it's time to wrap up and get back to harvest. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Take care now.